Welcome to Commons Conversations, a series of interviews with campaigners sharing their experiences and insights into activism, learning and movements, radical history and more. The podcast is produced by the Commons Social Change Library, a website containing over 1,000 resources for campaigners, which can be accessed for free at commonslibrary.org. This episode is from our second series and was originally broadcast on Community Radio 3CR. It features a conversation between Emily Wood Trounce and Alice Hardinge, the acting Tasmanian campaign manager for the Wilderness Society. In it, they explore the practice and value of citizen science and big tree hunting in locating and identifying threatened species. They discuss how this results in a number of valuable outcomes, including allowing conservationists to enforce existing rules regarding clear felling, while also supporting campaigns to fully end the logging of biodiverse ecosystems. The interview was conducted in late 2023 and begins with Alice discussing how she first became involved with forest defence. I'm Alice. I grew up on Woiwurrung Wurundjeri country, Big Pats Creek, which is close to Warburton. So that's in the upper Yarra Ranges of so-called Victoria. And, uh, yeah, I've worked uh, in quite a few grassroots uh, organisations, as well as um, working for the Wilderness Society as a forest campaigner. And yeah, I guess I was so blessed to grow up in the stunning forests of the Central Highlands, Gondwan and Rainforest. And back in about 2014, 2013, 2014, was my, my first kind of exposure to the Great Forest National Park campaign. And when I first became aware of some of the impacts that native forest logging was having on my local community. Yeah, I guess it really, uh, my involvement really stepped up when I became involved in blockading. So through Forest Conservation Victoria and through Protect Warburton Ranges. Uh, yeah, I guess entering into the, the blockading world um, throughout the Central Highlands, but also out in East Gippsland. And uh, a really big campaign, I guess, took me to that, that next level of, of love for the forest and, and also involvement um, was in Big Pat's Creek when logging was encroaching within kilometres of my childhood home. Yeah, and that kind of um, brought me into the community space a lot more uh, through Protect Warpton Ranges and also uh, through Warpton Environment. And we saw many, many weeks of sustained direct action in that area, um, so close, so close to my home. And, and that real passion and connection to the place, I think, was magnified through that experience of having grown up there, but then also seeing uh, the machines and the extractivism just on my doorstep. And, uh, yeah, the joy of, of connecting with the community um, that I grew up um, in, yeah, really spurred this, um, yeah, this passion and I guess that further involvement in the Victorian Forest Campaign and then, you know, onwards to the last year that I've lived in uh, Lutrida, Tasmania, and have worked on forest campaigns down here. Brilliant. And how did you find Tasmania's forests and fall in love with them? So I think my first penny drop moment <laughs> down in Lutrida, Tasmania, uh, was a few years ago when I came down for the summer. So I came down for a couple of months and yeah, I remember the first week I was here. Yeah, I had the privilege of going out with a group called Forestry Watch to do some citizen science uh, out in the Styx region. And uh, we went to an area of beautiful high conservation value forests uh, that was still standing, but we also did a post logging survey of an area that had been clear felled. And yeah, I think that moment of both the, the beauty and the intactness of, of these temperate rainforests in contrast with, uh, it was rather a hot day, um, this quite bleak industrially, um, logged area and, and seeing some of those, those values and really recognizing the threat. That was a bit of a moment where my, my heart started, yeah, really pumping for, um, Lutrida's forests as well. And over the, following years I came down over the summers and then yeah eventually moved here in December last year and yeah decided I really wanted to be more involved. There is something so uniquely horrific about being inside a Clearfeld coop. I think the first time that I experienced that it shocked me and yeah changed my life entirely the silence of the forest and they're always or pretty much always you know surrounded by lush 
mm. full forest with birds in them and then you walk into the Clearfeld area and it just is absolutely heartbreaking. I think that's something that yeah. we should all experience. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, one of the most powerful kind of incendiary moments that I've ever experienced was also um, in a Clearfell, and that was um, just before I got more involved in Big Putts Creek and Warbton campaign. Uh, I'd come back from travelling after high school, and I was a couple of kilometres up the road from my folks' place, and there was, um, yeah, a 120-hectare Clearfell, um, five, five logging coops next to each other, yeah, they just completed logging the top section and they were, were logging further below down the hill. And just that, yeah, the, the starkness of that exposed area on, on the mountainside and the, the, just the lack, the lack, the lack of the animals, the lack of the trees. Yeah, it was, um, it was really heartbreaking, but also really spurred something deep within me about fighting against that. Yeah. You know, you and I have been on a few tours to clear cells together and I've seen it be that incendiary moment for other people. Absolutely horrific. Um, but before you mentioned yeah, your time with Forestry Watch and I guess this concept of citizen science, and I do want to talk to you about big tree hunting and what you've done with citizen science in forests across Victoria and Tasmania. Could you speak a little bit to that and the big tree hunting? Like many folks, I think field work is probably my favourite work. <laughs> Being out uh, just, yeah, in the beautiful earth, really, and um, going out a- and looking for threatened species and for conservation values like the giant trees um, that you mentioned. Guess to go back to the kind of beginning of my involvement in citizen science. At first, it wasn't uh, necessarily giant trees or large trees that we were predominantly looking for. Uh, I first became involved um, with wildlife of the Central Highlands, so in Victoria, back in 2019. Then uh, with Warburton Environment, looking for um, a critically endangered, long-lived understory species, the Personia arborea. Yeah, at first, citizen science, uh, it's, it's super varied. as many different things that you can uh, go out and look for in uh, intact areas of forest or um previously logged areas of forest. But some of the things that we looked for were threatened species such as the Leadbeater's possum, as well as the greater glider and yellow belly glider. And then also flora species like the Personia boreata that I mentioned with warped environment. And all of these species uh, have certain prescriptions, so certain levels of protection. So by finding them, uh, citizen scientists going out, volunteering their time with really amazing equipment, we can get uh, buffer zones. So, for instance, with the Leadbeater's possum, every time you get a Leadbeater's possum recording, you know, you note it down on your GPS, you get um, video footage, evidence, and you can submit that to the relevant uh, government body and actually also potentially use it as court case evidence. And that way you get little patches of forest protected um, in the in the logging areas. So over time, for instance, Watch has protected over 1,500 hectares of forest throughout the Central Highlands. So that's wildlife of the Central Highlands by finding um, these records of threatened species. They're some of the conservation values we look for, but also in Victoria with citizen science, I became involved in uh, big tree hunting <laughs> with uh, Brett Nifsid as well. So going and looking out uh, for very significant old growth trees are often eucalypts and recording uh, where they stand and where these kind of last stands of really highly ecologically intact areas with high ecological integrity are so, yeah, citizen science is, is super varied and it's a super fun way uh, to get involved in conservation uh, by being out in the field, uh, enjoying beautiful places, seeing unique animals that many people don't ever get to see because they may be nocturnal. Also, to boot, uh, get areas yet yeah, protected from from logging. So it's a really a win-win-win in my situation. But, uh, yeah, I've got to admit, uh, one of my soft spots is uh, is the giant tree hunting or, or big tree hunting for sure. And I want to return to the big tree hunting. But first, the Leadbeater's possum I know is tiny. I think it's the smallest possum in the world, right? And they're critically endangered. There are so few of them left in the wild. They fit in the palm of the human hand. How on earth do you find a possum that small in the forest at night? 
Yeah, that is a really good point, Emily. <laughs> so the Leadbeater's possum, uh, as you as you said, is is this tiny and and really um, really critically endangered species. So there's only 1,500 of them left throughout the Central Highlands, and they've got quite a small endemic range as well. So uh, in order to find them. Uh, you do need some specialised equipment. Uh, so what we use is um, we use infrared cameras in order to detect their uh, heat signal in the forest. Um, we also use some uh, calling techniques as well um, to communicate with the possums, so to help call them in. Uh, sometimes we also play um, powerful hour recordings, uh, so they actually... Uh, they're really staunch little possums. Um, as you mentioned, they're really small, but uh, when they hear uh, a powerful owl call, which is one of their main predators, uh, they actually, in their family group, will sometimes uh, come up and kind of like little possum ninjas uh, investigate powerful owl calls uh, to try and uh, ward them off from their territory. So, yeah, we use those infrared cameras as well as um, video cameras and we use um, GPS Garmin devices as well in order to yeah first detect these possums but then also get really um, high quality video evidence get also in the shot uh, that image of where we are in location just so we can really prove that these possums are out there in, in these exact locations and then be able to get those uh, buffers and protected areas in in place for those species. So pretty much you're telling me and citizen science teams we're not out doing this amazing work in Victoria's forest, would they just be logging those regions? Like, would they just be completely smashed these places with threatened species in them? Yeah, well, that's something that is um, quite fascinating about, uh, yeah, the the real importance of citizen science uh, in forest campaigning. Due to the um, state-owned logging agencies having jurisdiction, what I mean by that is they are state logging is exempt from federal environmental law, so the states are regulating logging practices within their own states due to the regional forest agreements. So what we're seeing is the government not necessarily putting the required resources into surveying these areas and finding these threatened species. So then the gap is left to be filled by volunteer citizen scientists. And it's absolutely crucial that we have people going out into these forested areas, especially areas of forest that are under threat from industrial processes, be that through extractivism for logging or also extractivism for mining, like we see in Western Australia, and go out and actually record where these species are. Because, as you said, um, unfortunately, if it weren't for volunteer citizen scientists, uh, many of these areas containing, in some cases, critically endangered species like the Leadbeater's possum would have just been logged due to inadequate surveying practices by the government programs. It's so crazy that, you know, we have state-owned agencies logging, destroying and profiting from state-owned forests. They're just completely in control of the whole situation. But do you find that if you do get adequate evidence, you get a good video of a Leadbeater's possum, you GPS mark it properly, you put the report in in all the right ways, does that guarantee protection for that forest? And for a Leddy, how much protection is guaranteed? So um, it does actually guarantee um, protection through um, these special protection zones. These special protection zones um, are specific for um, each species so and also state specific so some of the conservation values that we may find uh, through citizen science in Tasmania will dif- get have different prescriptions get different buffer zones uh, to the species that we citizen science survey for in Victoria so for example the late beaters possum uh, gets a 200 meter buffer zone so it's a 200 meter radius buffer zone around um, the location where it's recorded. So that's about 12 hectares of forest, uh, which is better than nothing. But of course, uh, it would be even better if we saw the cessation of extractive industries in threatened species habitat altogether. So this patchwork approach has done absolute wonders um, for the incremental protection of some of these species. However, systematically, of course, we still have um, a situation where poor regulation is allowing uh, the yeah extractive processes and the logging of some areas, which you know never never should be up for logging, considering the impacts on biodiversity and carbon and on these threatened species habitat. 
And of course, one of the limitations of citizen science is we have you know, this great amount of enthusiasm and a lot of dedicated individuals. Uh, but when we look at the scale, um, for instance, uh, in Lutrida, Tasmania, uh, there's over 700 uh, logging coops on the three-year plan. So there's over 700 areas that are threatened by logging across the state. And even with the most dedicated and professional citizen science um, volunteer teams, it's, you know, it's a lot to have the capacity to do anywhere near the number of all those logging coops. So we're really having to target areas um, that we've assessed as, you know, some of the most high conservation value areas, although really um, we would love to have capacity to survey the whole of the state. And the same goes with Victoria. Obviously, that's also affected by um, the end of native forest logging announcement that happened earlier this year in May. Yeah, it's absolutely wild that this crucial work is left largely to groups of volunteers to go and spend their time in the forest. Surely this falls under the responsibility of the logging agencies. Like You talked about the regional forest agreements. I know that they're not bound by federal environmental law, but they do have regulations, right? Surely it is their responsibility legally to do this survey work, to know what's in the forest, to not log where endangered species are. Am I correct? Yeah, so there there is um, a regulatory framework uh, in each state. So, for instance, uh, in Tasmania, uh, you know, there's there's normally a, a timber code of practice, um, which um, varies in name, state by state, uh, but is the one of the the codes of which the logging industry must abide by. There's also um, state legislation. So, in Tasmania, we have the Forest Practices Act. In practice, um, it's again all about that resourcing, that prioritisation of doing thorough surveys. So there is a independent regulator in Tasmania called the Forest Practices Authority, uh, who do issue the certification of individual logging area plans. So we call logging areas coops a lot of the time. So these forest practices plans for specific um, logging coops. However, there are questions around um, the co-regulation of forest practices, whether it is truly independent. And also, again, uh, just on the ability to thoroughly resource and prioritise um, citizen science and, and surveying, government-issued surveying, uh, because uh, there really isn't, I haven't seen the evidence that there, there is really thorough surveying going on um, in Lutruda, Tasmania, and it was it was similar in Victoria. They're not dedicating the money or, or the people necessarily to actually go out and record um, all these high conservation values. And, yeah, that brings us back again to to citizen science and volunteers filling in the gaps and also filling in the gaps on regulation. So we are recording a lot of alleged breaches of the Forest Practices Code and also reporting to the um, Forest Practices Authority, the regulator, as well as the government of whenever we find um, alleged breaches. However, there is also issues and questions around the effectiveness and the willingness to regulate as a state government and as a independent forest regulator. And a poignant example of this is we are yet to see any prosecutions from the Forest Practices Authority, the regulator down here in Tasmania, against the state-owned logging agency, Forestry Tasmania. So despite many alleged breaches being submitted by citizen scientists, so again, it's left up to citizens to, um, yeah, to make use of that space and try to hold the government to account for its current logging practices. I wouldn't go so far to say they keep no regulating, uh, but I I would criticise the regulator for not taking more effective, consistent, yeah, regulation measures for the state-owned logging agency. So the regulator in Lutrida, Tasmania, also regulates private uh, native forest logging, uh, and we do see this skew uh, between resourcing and regulating private land um, over resourcing and regulating public land. So I do think there are very um, reasonable questions to be asked around uh, why the regulator is not adequately resourced to regulate and why is there a lack of enthusiasm, seemingly, to regulate the state-owned logging agency for all the alleged breaches that citizen scientists report. 
And why do you think there is that disparity between the regulation of private clearing and state logging? It goes quite deep in Lutrida, Tasmania. So we are seeing the end of native forest logging in Victoria and in WA, and we're seeing, uh, I would say, quite an ideological shift in some of the populations of those states, respectively, uh, around uh, being aware of the effects of native forest logging and also a a bit of a cultural shift. Uh, However, in Tasmania, uh, I do think we have a fair way to go when it comes uh, to the ideological front. There is still a lot of romanticisation around the logging industry. There's also a belief that it supports a lot more of the working population than it actually does. So studies have shown, recent studies showed that um, the Tasmanian population believed that 20% of people were employed by um, the logging industry but it's actually less than 0.4%, uh, a few thousand, including direct and indirect jobs. So I think there is uh, a lot of ideological shift that needs to come in Tasmania, and that is also respective of the government's willingness to act. So at the moment, we have a Liberal government in power in Tasmania. It's the last Liberal state left. But we also have a opposition, the Labor Party, who... Um, believes fervently uh, in the native forest logging industry and it's almost as if uh, neither of them want to be wedged on the issue so they're actually competing to be more pro-industry than the other. So uh, I think that might be (laughs) one of the reasons why we see um, poor regulation and poor resourcing of the regulation of the native forest logging industry. Yeah, it's good to get that context, especially with the party that's in power and just sort of the the cultural attitude towards forests and logging. But I think it is, it's kind of surprising to hear that. I know that the forestry industry is sort of admired in a lot of places in Tasmania, but at the same time, like as a Victorian, I look at Tasmania and I think big trees, lots of conservation, huge national parks, massive amounts of that island are without roads. People go hiking, like there's this sort of you know, people idolise nature in Tasmania. And it's it's interesting to think about that dichotomy of so much logging, so much industrial disruption of the forests, whilst also the romanticisation of these forest regions. We are absolutely blessed down here with uh, one of the highest ranked world heritage areas in the entire world. Uh, and, you know, In different classes of reserve systems, some reserve tenures uh, actually allow logging and mining, but you can say uh, almost half of the state is in some form of reserve. However, as one of the most forested states uh, in so-called Australia, there is also, yeah, that that contrast with there still being uh, 812,000 hectares in a land tenure known as permanent timber production zone. So that's the that's the area that is subject to native forest logging of, of public land. So there is this um yeah this large reserve estate. Um some of those areas uh, do still need further protection from extractivism. But then you've also got this huge area of land that has been set aside specifically for logging. So I do believe that Tasmania may end up being the Albany uh, of whaling, but for native forest logging. So we are seeing shifts um, in New South Wales, uh, potentially um, ending native forest logging or greatly reducing native forest logging there. And I do believe it is 100% possible for Tasmania, but I do think a lot of political, um, cultural, and I guess just community more broadly shift is necessary in order to get there. And part of that is also the, the deeply entrenched conflict over native forests that uh, have, revol- have revolved around um, Tasmanian politics for, for decades. You think of um, how foundational uh, things like the Franklin blockade were and how some of those effects are still felt and some of those political influences uh, from the 70s and 80s are still, you know, run rife here in, in Tasmania and yeah, I feel like there is there is quite a bit of a way to go, but uh, one of the advantages of having all those wild protected places throughout the World Heritage and different land tenures is that we know it's possible. There have been 
huge wins down here before for the environment. And I do really believe that uh, native forest logging will end down here as well. Uh, we're just going to have to put a fair bit of work into into getting the state ready to make that decision. Yeah, and the longer it takes, the more forest, like irreplaceable forest, is going to be destroyed, and that's the stakes are so high. I feel like yeah. this leads quite well into talking about some of the work you've been doing with the big tree hunting and the, these sort of campaigns to like valorize the forests and these giant trees and, and rebrand Tasmania as this land of the giants, you know, helping Tasmanian people identify with the, these big trees, these amazing diverse forests as something to be really proud of and to admire a lot. Yeah, so... Uh, what have you been doing uh, with big tree hunting? Tell us about it. Yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah, one of my absolute favourite things to do uh, is go out into um, the stunning forests down here and, and look for these giant trees. So giant trees are another one of the conservation values that do um, actually get protection from logging when, when you find them. Um, so just a bit of context. What is a giant tree? <laughs> so um, definitional issues are rife within the conservation movement. Uh, but under uh, Forestry Tasmania's policy, that's the state-owned logging agency's policy, uh, a giant tree is a tree that's over 280 cubic metres in wood volume or over 85 metres tall. So um, first off, I need to say that for context, but I also want to say that uh, that is completely arbitrary. Um, if you're a swift parrot, you're not going to care if a tree is 84 metres tall or 85 metres tall. But it is important to, to note that when I'm talking about giant trees, I could specifically be referring to um, this policy that the, that the loggers have. But going off into what does looking for giant trees look like and mean, it means uh, lovely long days off track in areas of, of absolutely fantastic old growth, uh, lots of cool temperate rainforests and these huge emergent eucalypts. Often we're talking about eucalyptus regnans, uh, the mountain ash, or uh, also uh, eucalyptus globulus, uh, giant blue gums. Eucalyptus tasmani tasmaniensis, which is the um, delicatensis from the mainland. But these trees, uh, in order to reach this kind of giant threshold, are often 17, 18, 19, 20 metres around the base when you, when you measure them with a measuring tape. So we're talking about walking through these forests and coming across these ancient trees well over 500 years old for the for the eucalypt species to get this large, and they could be six, seven metres in diameter, just this wall of wood before you, and, of course, full of hollows and habitat for all sorts of threatened species. But one of the other really special things about these trees is if you find them on that permanent timber production zone that we spoke about, that area that is subject to logging, these trees also get a 100 metre radius uh, no logging zone. So they get an informal reserve created whenever we find these trees and submit them. So not only do you get to have that experience of, of walking through this wonderful old growth, uh, but also by finding these trees, we're getting little pockets, um, 3.12 hectares per tree uh, taken off the logging schedule. So we, uh, yeah, get out as much as we can and, and go out and look for these big trees, uh, not just for uh, conservation from logging, but also to measure uh, how much carbon they're storing, as well as uh, generally wanting to do some more scientific studies on these areas because they are some of the most carbon-dense forests in the world. And also, as far as tall trees and giant trees go, really – the only place that you could compare it to of density of large trees and, and giant trees would be the redwoods. And the redwoods are world famous. And it's probably about time that we started valuing these giant trees. Uh, they're really just miracles of nature um, for what they are in Tasmania instead of logging them for low value chip. So a lot of the giant tree work and the giant tree hunting is, yeah, really around finding these trees first off to, to stop them from being logged, but also about iconising them and, and letting people know about them, letting folks know that, uh, yeah, in Lutrida, Tasmania, 
we have some of the largest trees in the world. They're they're really miraculous, and we should be uh, visiting them and looking into regenerative tourism options instead of seeing that industrial clear fell mentality because uh, they're worth so much more standing. 500 years old is so long. <laughs> yeah. Know, I've seen some big trees. Nothing like what you would have seen, but, yeah, every time you're with them, it just feels so amazing to think of how ancient this creature is, how much it's seen, how much life has come through it and lived around it and with it. But you're talking about finding big trees like are you what what do you mean by this don't we know where the big trees are like are you actually discovering trees that the government hasn't marked out that they don't know are there like what is finding a big tree well it's exactly that it's it's going out um to areas that either um have never been surveyed um or are threatened by logging potentially and yeah, the, the government and the logging industry, they don't, they don't know about um, where these trees are. So when we um, say big tree hunting, <laughs> we are actually going um, often, often driving an hour, sometimes more, sometimes two or three to a often quite remote area of forest, then um, spending the day, sometimes, you know, 12 hours, sometimes less, walking off track through through the bush country and um, into areas that are potentially scheduled um, for logging or that we know uh, potentially do contain these giant trees. And we're walking through the forest, uh, often using our GPS and uh, after doing some desktop analysis, and, and we're finding finding these trees and photographing and recording them. And then we're letting um, the logging agency as well as the government regulator know about these trees because without submitting that evidence, we wouldn't be able to get those um, protected buffers created. So it is something um, quite special knowing that these trees, you know, as you said, like 500 years is so long, have been standing here hundreds and hundreds of years before colonisation. And these trees are, you know, a absolutely like of such of such value and also of cultural value and I often think about how um if it weren't for um yeah citizen scientists going out and and letting the government know about these trees that uh you know we still see quite often um without without those submitted reports these trees just get cut down and uh some of the listeners may have seen some of the single load log photos so that's when a um, a tree is so big that you can only just fit one log on the back of a log truck. And I think um, some folks may or may not have seen some of the photos of single load logs um, coming from Tasmania this year. And some got some international media attention. But yeah, we still see um, these practices of um, large giant trees getting cut down for, for cheap milling, cheap paper, pulp and paper products. Absolutely horrific, those videos and photos of that, you know, that one log that went viral were heartbreaking and so, so shocking. Because, yeah, you, you, you know, we, we all assume that this sort of thing has serious permanent protections, like that if a logger saw that tree, they would know, don't cut down this giant of the forest. But they're doing it and then seriously turning it into, like pulping it, turning it into paper or cardboard is mm. yeah, it's a travesty. It is. Uh, one of the one of the things about going and finding these trees as well is when I mean, you have these really special moments, like looking just up at the, the grandeur and, and thinking how many generations of of animals these trees have um, provided habitat and homes for. And you also think about yeah the the amount of time that that these these trees have have lived for as well, like seeing all the changes over the last couple of centuries and how much carbon they've accumulated day by day growing and, and, and sucking that carbon back into into the soil and, and into the mycelium networks. It's really just uh, – I, I can't really – I don't really even have the words to explain how much um, I appreciate and love being being out in, in those um, particular areas of forest that, you know, have been without – uh, that uh, extractivism for, for so long that they, they still have that um, ecological integrity um, and just amazing biodiversity as well. But I think these these trees, there's still a there's still a long way to go in. Yeah, I guess showing the the greater population uh, just how important and and yeah valuable uh, these places are. Uh, not 
necessarily only from an economic standpoint, although there are, again, re- regenerative tourism opportunities perhaps here, uh, more so from an intrinsic value standpoint and from an ecosystem services standpoint as well. So I think, um, yeah, the more, the more giant trees we can find, the better. Already just this year, uh, we've protected over 30 hectares, um, from discovering these, these giant trees of which the threshold is so high, um, it's quite hard to find trees that meet that threshold. These are the 0.01% trees or even less, you know, there's, there's only a couple hundred that have been recorded across the state and it's likely that there wouldn't be, uh, there would only be a couple more hundred um, that haven't been recorded yet uh, before that threshold is reached. And, of course, this is also in the context of um, we've seen throughout the Central Highlands and also uh, in Victoria and also in, in Lutrida, Tasmania, uh, the decline of large hollow-bearing trees, uh, especially at risk from, from fire and from climate change, which just makes it all the more crucial to find these areas and protect them whilst we still can. It must be so interesting dancing with, as you campaign, dancing with these different systems of value. You know, you're talking about the intrinsic value of the forests, and this makes me think about the utter relief you must feel, you know, having grown up in an industrialised, extractive world, and then finding these giants, these pre-colonial trees living in these sound ecosystems with so much diversity and so much magic inside of them, and, and just feeling that and seeing that, witnessing that and knowing the intrinsic value of these forests. But then you're also talking about, like, ecosystem services, and you're definitely dancing the dance, you know, of our our colony and the systems of value that are, you know, primarily financial within that. Yeah, we're also talking about carbon storage, these mountain ash trees being, you know, the the most carbon-dense species of tree in the world. And then we're talking about climate change and that whole, yeah, it, it must be so interesting because I, I know from the way you're talking, I can tell that you're feeling the love for these trees and feeling their value outside of any of that, but then having to frame it in the language of Australia, of capital that we have here, and, you know, trying to translate in order to, as you're saying, iconize these trees and these forests for the greater Tasmanian Australian global population in a language that works for them and sort of you know, so much of environmental campaigning is shifting people along these systems of value so that they can get to understanding the intrinsic value of forests. But you you often have to start speaking in much more, I don't know, empirical or practical terms. Yeah, very much so. And I guess I guess, you know, the that one of the issues here is uh the only way in all the only way that we can get protection for some of these areas, some of these conservation values like giant trees or, or you know, Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles or, or devil dens is by um, submitting the data but ultimately playing by the rules that the government has provided through the Timber Practices Code, through the Forest Practices Act. And the rules are not great, to be frank. There's yeah. lots of grey areas. Um, they're are a lot of values that, um, you know, the prescriptions, the the rules that we can apply, you know, they're very limited. And uh, there is definitely nowhere within the Forest Practices Act or within the Forest Practices Code or within, I guess, the um, capital state regulation in general uh, that provides for intrinsic value. So (laughs) as much as that uh, really speaks to me and speaks to many of us, uh, unfortunately, when we're advocating uh, for the protection of these places, uh, often we will use what rules we have available um, to us, uh, and that's a starting point. <laughs> and when you're doing all of this big tree hunting and iconising the forest, who are you working with? What have you been doing? Yeah, so uh, one of the great things about um, citizen science, big tree hunting, forest campaigning in general uh, is the community, is the people you get to meet. I mean, that's uh, one of the things that really, really drives me is those connections and, and that passion. So uh, at the moment, I'm working in the role as uh, acting campaign manager of Wilderness Society Tasmania. Uh, so 
within that role, um, I work with a great small team, but we also um, do a lot of work with um, local communities and, yeah, volunteer citizen scientists. So at the throughout this year, I've, I've done a, a lot of work with uh, quite a few different groups. Um, the Tree Projects, absolutely amazing group, uh, leading strong on uh, – science, uh, canopy-led science. So you've got Dr. Jennifer Sanger, uh, a forest ecologist, and, and her husband, Steve Pierce, uh, who is an amazing photographer. And they're doing brilliant work on, yeah, really um, spreading the word about the absolute beauty and, and the incredible nature of some of the trees down here in, in Lutarita, as well as um, Grassroots Action Network Tasmania. That's another amazing um, grassroots community group uh, who have been out doing citizen science in the forests over this year. And there is also a Wilderness Society um, coordinated citizen science program. Uh, and we go out to the southern forests, uh, out to the sticks, the Florentine. We've been up north around Quamby Bluff. And we do work with local community groups like Hands Off Quamby, as well as uh, folks who live in Maydina. So that's kind of a bit north, a couple of hours north of Hobart. And uh, yeah, it's really, yeah, one of the one of the best things about uh, about citizen science uh, is just that experience uh, with with other people, um, the friends you make, and and the really strong uh, connection with local communities who are super passionate about their patch. Uh, the, the, the area of um, forest that they live nearby to. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much uh, better than, than going out for the day, um, sitting uh, under a big myrtle with all these magic coral fungi at your feet, having, having a picnic lunch with uh, a couple of people who are equally as passionate about finding, yeah, conservation values, large trees, giant trees, devil dens, you name it, uh, in order to get some protection for, for, yeah, for bush country. Such special forest and such a special community. And yeah, really cool to hear about sort of the different nodes in the ecosystem of campaigners and citizen scientists who are doing this work in Tasmania. And I guess that brings us quite well to talk a little bit more about campaign strategy as as we go forward. And I guess to give some context for the people listening, Alice and I are talking at the end of 2023 and logging industries across the continent are really shifting at the moment because a few years ago the Western Australian state government decided that they were going to pull the pin on native forest logging happening in Western Australia at the end of 2023. So in 2024 there will be no more native logging in WA. There are of course exceptions to that and you touched on that briefly before Alice, like bauxite mining in WA's Jarrah Forest in the southwest of the state is entirely exempt from that declaration. So yes, there will still be some logging, some clearing in order to make way for bauxite mining, which is aluminium production. And But largely, it is going to be the end of native forest logging in that state. And we're actually seeing a similar circumstance here where I am in Victoria, where just in May this year, the state government decided to end native forest logging at the same time, meaning that in 2024, the industry will shut down. And there are, of course, Exemptions here too, we're still seeing salvage logging, we're still seeing pretty disruptive timber clearing for fire fire breaks and this sort of thing. But that is, in both of these cases, an industry drying up and we are seeing in New South Wales moves towards the same. And that's a totally new context because timber production has been huge for all of these places and for Australia as a nation, except Tasmania. You know, when you're speaking to the industry there, doing the opposite thing rather than moving to plantations and winding up this destruction of our native forests. It's ramping up, it's intensifying. and Yeah, it is such a fascinating time uh, for forest campaigning uh, right across so-called Australia. So, yeah, with the end of native forest logging in Victoria, uh, it has actually had a direct um, impact on uh, Lutrida's forests because we're seeing every day logging trucks driving across the state up towards Devonport, getting on the Spirit of Tasmania and then getting off uh, in Geelong and driving to the mills around Hayfield, uh, high conservation value forests from Tasmania going straight to Victorian mills. So 
it is a quite a delicate situation um, where in one area you've seen, you know, the cessation of an extractive industry, uh, but it is actually having an effect on uh, another region, on, on Tasmania's forests. It's, it's really upping the pressure. And there is uh, generally an acceptance amongst the industry, the transition towards plantation, you know, it, it's well and truly underway. Uh, in fact, if you if you look across uh, the whole of Australia uh, and then to Tasmania specifically, across Australia, it's about 90% of our wood products from plantation um, domestically. And in Tasmania, it's uh, about 85%. So still quite high, a little bit lower than the mainland. Uh, however, um, what we are seeing is uh, native forest logging last year uh, in Tasmania was 7,000 hectares. Uh, and we've seen an increase of a thousand hectares, uh, to the, uh, logging plans, a three year plan. So, um, now that means that, that next year, um, 42,000 hectares are subject to imminent native forest logging. That doesn't mean that it'll all be done in, in the following three years, but I guess this speaks to the, the pressure of getting, uh, native forest products still to some of those mills in Victoria, as well as um, the ongoing um, native forest logging for Tasmanian suppliers. So from a campaign strategy standpoint, the pressure is really on for um, Luch Reader's forests. And what we're going to see over the next few years is um, a real drop in supply of native forest logging products. So 2027, there's this huge drop off of supply, and that's due to um, overlogging as well. So it's really um, crux, um, yeah, the crux of the campaign in many ways over the next year or two about making sure that that transition to plantation is completed, that we do see a cessation of native forest logging. And in order to get there, uh, we're going to have to use many tools in our tool belt, uh, be that uh, people power, getting people out into the forests, uh, there is also, um, I guess, scope for some more iconising of the forest areas in light of a once-in-a-generation election coming likely next year. So that's when seats will go from 25 seats to 35 seats in the Tasmanian parliament. So um, we do have a lot of scope to see a government down in Tasmania with a lot more independence and greens and, and possibly a balance of power situation. Uh, and there's also the need for um, some strategic litigation potentially from community groups as well as from ENGOs around the legality or alleged illegality of logging in this state. And something that I think is also really important from a campaign strategy standpoint is making sure that the supply chains, um, that the businesses who end up with the the end products from some of this timber, again, most of it going to Wood chip and disposable products over, over 75% going to wood chip. But for those, um, long-term products, um, those chairs, window claddings, things like that, there needs to be a really concerted effort to educate businesses about where they're getting their products from. And well, we yeah, that, that some of these items are coming directly from critically endangered species habitat, like the swift parrot. So I think there is a lot of work to be done over the next few years, uh, some really big steps to make, but I do think completing the transition away from native forest logging to plantation is inevitable and also well and truly underway, despite uh, the increased threat of logging uh, in Tasmania of native forests due to the shutdown of the industry on the mainland. Yeah, wow, well, you're really embodying that concept of diversity of tactics. Hey, you're talking about supply chain market-based campaigning, you're talking about citizen science, you're talking about the sort of corporate world, you're talking about, well, we have been talking about direct action, strategic litigation, taking them to the courts. There's so much work going into this. It's incredible. Yeah, and it, it takes it takes a lot of takes a lot of passionate people to get there. So yeah, definitely um huge recognition and shout out to the many many diverse groups uh, who are working on, on forest campaigns in Lutrida, Tasmania. Um, there's, yeah, there's so many amazing people, uh, but we could always do with more. Thank you so much for all of your work, Alice, and yeah, so much respect, admiration and appreciation to everyone fighting for 
Tasmania's forest. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. And uh, yeah, just noting that, that all the work that uh, we're doing down here in, in Lutrida, Tasmania, is also taking place on unceded Palawa land. And, you know, when we're campaigning for these forests, first and foremost, the they're twice stolen forests. They're stolen during colonisation and logging is continuing without the consent of the Aboriginal people of Tasmania. So really wanting to highlight that as well.